the University of London uh, is has, a, has been around for a long time historically, but it, it's never been quite the same thing. It's changed uh, its purposes, its missions, in many ways over the years in response to the changing world around it. But the common theme that uh, was at, at the founding of the University of London and continues to be at the heart of its mission is really access to world-class higher education. Um, some of you may be aware of the history, but if you turn the clock back uh, to the beginning of the 19th century, um, in, in England there were Oxford and Cambridge, and both of those institutions very closely linked historically to very limited uh, disciplines, the theology and philosophy and medicine and law, um, but very much also linked to religion, the Church, Church of England. So the great thing about the University of London were two dramatic new forms of access. One was it freed up access to higher education from linkage and allegiance to religion, the religion of the, of the state in the UK, and over the years it freed up access to higher education for women and played a, a huge part in that opening up of higher education in, in the UK. And the University of London originally external program took that access, not just from the centre of London, but through partners in places that are now well-known universities in their own right, uh, Nottingham and Reading and Exeter, names that will be known to many of you, those were places where you could access this new University of London uh, uh, degree. And so that theme has never left the university, but the extent of its outreach, obviously just evidenced by the gathering here today, is now incredibly global, whereas once it was local within the UK. But that theme, that theme of access, that theme of opening up uh, higher education at a world-class level still remains absolutely the key to what the University of London is about. It's a complex entity, the University of London, because as many of you will know, the actual admission of undergraduate students and the teaching of students takes place in the constituent colleges of the University of London. So there is a center to the University of London, but it is also a federation a kind of uh, sophisticated membership club of some of the most important uh, world-ranking institutions in the UK. Some of them very big multi-faculty universities, University College, King's. Some uh, smaller specialist institutions. So it really is a, a unique kind of club that ranges from something as, as world-leading and big as university college across all disciplines, right through to, for example, the Courtauld Institute, which is one of the world's greatest centers of learning in, in fine art, the Royal Academy of Music, one of the world's great conservatoires, and very specialist institutions, London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, with its focus. All the great medical schools of London are now absorbed into the multi-faculty colleges. So this is a unique gathering of some of the greatest um, higher education institutions that have this common theme of world excellence and through the federation and through the international programs uh, making that uh, wonderful higher education accessible to a much wider world. So this is, um, for me, a wonderful uh, institution to be part of. Uh, but as we all know, uh, the world constantly changes. And we had a very interesting session at 8 o'clock, really, where people got up and said what was happening in their own countries in terms of higher education policy, in terms of the regulatory framework for that policy, in terms of student behavior, of competition, uh, of other institutions from around the world entering into their uh, backyard, as it were. 
So where, where do we position ourselves? Um, we have to, I think, stick to some very simple propositions. The University of London, part of its mission is to reach out to the world and it is to provide access to unique quality higher education. And as part of that enterprise, rather than life being a series of bilateral transactional relationships between the University of London and XYZ, I think for us this idea of a network of a collection of people that are not just in one-to-one -one transactions with us, but who know each other, uh, who share uh, thoughts, expertise, problems, uh, is also very important. So I, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to come and meet with many of you, but also just to experience that sense of a network which underlines even more that global nature of our interaction. From the perspective of my own recent history, as um, Tim said, I spent the last four years uh, working uh, in the UK government where we made major policy changes to the way we were funding higher education and the government was also making major re-evaluations of its role and the nature of the relationship of the UK to the rest of the world. We've obviously had global economic crisis much of our recent history in the UK uh, has been as part of the European Union and as you will all know the Eurozone itself has very specific kind of problems arising from uh, world economic uh, meltdown. So there's a lot of re-evaluation going on in the UK about its relationship with the rest of the world and part of that is looking much beyond Europe across the channel in terms of markets and future relationships. So for the UK government, global outreach, both uh, economic, diplomatic, and very much in the uh, higher education being seen as part of that framework is more and more important. And so the positioning we have already in the University of London with our networks is of wider interest than just to us in the University of London or just to higher education from the point of view of the UK government, these kind of links are fundamental uh, going forward. As I said, not just economically, but diplomatically and in terms of global security issues. There's a big rethink going on in the UK about our relationship with the rest of the world. In terms of um, the University of London programs, looking ahead, what, what does the future look like? Well, one thing is very simple. Part of what I did when I was uh, working in the ministry, we looked at the demographics of countries across the world. We were partly looking at it in terms of emerging markets, but actually, you know those tree-like figures where you get the age distributions? The massive growth of that cohort of, let's even take just 18-year-olds across the world, who would be the cohort who you would think of as potential for higher education. The numbers are incredible. And simple arithmetic and simple economics tells you that you cannot, across the world, build within each country the higher education capacity to meet that demand. Economically and in terms of migration policies and visa policies across the world, those numbers aren't going to travel around the world either. So it all tells you that in whatever form and whatever hybrids, distance virtual learning in association with partners across the world has a huge growth potential. The arithmetic just doesn't go away. And so for all of us, I think there is the interesting issue, how do we position ourselves in that space? And some of the earlier conversations we had at 8 o'clock were really quite interesting because there is a lot of competition. If we can see that there are huge opportunities there, so can you know, other countries, other private providers. So where do we locate ourselves? And I think what we will continually assert at the heart of what we're about is we, we must maintain the kind of standards that you associate with those colleges of the University of London. 
So the, st the standard of our offering is what distinguishes us ultimately from a, not a lot of other entrants into that market. So we need to be very careful how we move forward because if there are competitions, we want to win them, but we don't want to win them at any price. So we have a, a, a very delicate uh, positioning. We have to constantly observe and understand what's happening in all the individual countries, what's happening competitively, what's happening in higher education uh, policy. Then we need to carefully debate within London, within the University of London and the colleges of the University of London of how we position ourselves given those opportunities and those threats. So we need to understand carefully what's happening in terms of country strategies, in terms of regulatory changes and recognize that there will not only be uh, competition from providers but there will be challenges that come from new disruptive technologies. We don't know, uh, you know, you, if you wind the clock back 10 years ago you would not have forecast the iPad and so on and so forth. So you just don't know what kind of technological disruptions there will be to the landscape and we will all have to evaluate as we go along how we use those. So just to, to, to finish, you can think of all these issues and be very depressed and say the world is a very challenging place, isn't it terrible? Or you can say what fantastic opportunities lay ahead, how exciting it is. So I'm all for being excited and I'm very excited that you're all here and are going to solve all these problems during the week. I look forward to hearing the solution.